All right, Corey, welcome to Bitcoin Builders slash The Breakdown. How are you doing, sir? Hey, good to see you, NLW. Been a minute. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm super excited. Uh, I, I think uh, there's there's tons to talk about. It's a great time. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to have some fun today, I think. It's a Friday afternoon when we're recording. Perfect time, I guess, Friday morning for you. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm excited. There, there's a lot of very interesting things happening in Bitcoin. So we'll do a little bit of that, talk a little bit about the swan journey and uh, and see where it leads us. But, I, you know, I want to start with a like a high framing question because, you know, we're a year out from the halving. Uh, we've got some very interesting new phenomenon happening around Bitcoin right now. I think that this is the type of time that sort of Bitcoin narratives are most up for grabs. Like they haven't hardened yet for the next cycle. We're sort of like over whatever we talked about last cycle, at least a little bit. And I guess the, the where I want to start is, you know, do you think there is such thing right now as Bitcoin maximalism or has that term become outdated? Like, is it a parody of itself in some ways? What do you think? Yeah, we have to remember that the term maximalism was coined by Vitalik and it was intended as an epithet and it was trying to, you know, make the case that Bitcoiners were closed minded in some way because they didn't like altcoins and they didn't think that altcoins had a future. And so, you know, my view, just to lay it out there, is that, well, yes, way more than 99% of altcoins are in fact intentional scams. Of course, we've all met people with good intentions and high integrity that are working on crypto DeFi blockchain stuff. Like I know, I know people working in that space that I would consider to be good people. So I'm not saying they're all scammers. What I do believe is that uh, even if there is some kind of innovation that lasts from the non-Bitcoin altcoin space, it won't have its own token in the long run. That doesn't mean that you can't trade the heck out of them today and play memes and do all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it also doesn't mean that with tens of billions of dollars invested and you know thousands of engineers working on things that there aren't going to be some cool things that are applicable to the real world, not just crypto trading that come out of this stuff. That's very likely that that will happen. Again, it just means that we aren't going to move toward a future of barter and microcurrencies and these things will use the dominant currency of the world, which in the long run will be Bitcoin. But in the near term, as you can see with the rise of stable coins, uh, it's dollars. No, I, I, it's super interesting. I, I think that fascinatingly, do, I mean, do you think that the emergence of an NFT like thing on Bitcoin? I mean, we'll talk about whether, you know, what, what, you, what your take on ordinals is in general, but just in the context of this conversation, do you think that is evidence of exactly that point, that things will eventually find their way to sort of the, the most secure, most decentralized chain? Uh, I think this is kind of just noise in mm -hmm. the near term, and it doesn't really matter that much. And I don't actually agree with the premise that there's some kind of new narrative up for grabs. I think that we're still in the very, very early stages of 8 billion humans waking up to the fact that Bitcoin is the best tool for the store of value that we've ever had and will have probably like game theoretically thinking about it like it's it's hard to imagine a more perfect store of value definitely not one that's 10x better uh anytime in the next few centuries so i think this is what we are working on is helping people wake up to that fact and then because bitcoin also functions as a medium of exchange and a settlement layer uh you don't really need anything else to perform those functions you know, so even if there were, as as Michael Saylor used to talk about, you know, a couple of years ago before Lightning kind of started to explode and start to look like it actually could handle the medium of exchange function, and I think it's likely that it does in the in the in the midterm to long term. Uh, even without that, centralized companies handling the last mile and running their own ledgers between each other, but at least being able to do final settlement, even if Bitcoin base layer fees ended up being hundreds or thousands of dollars it would still make sense for that to be the medium of exchange as well. And then you would just use the regular financial system as it is today, swapping B in for euros, yen, yuan, dollars, you know, over the next few decades. So or ordinals are noise is the, is the, is the short term assessment. Yeah, it just doesn't really matter much. I mean, I, I think there will be lots of things that people find valuable to inscribe in transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. I mean, 
I think when you and I talked for the first time, probably back in 2019, when I was launching Give Bitcoin, you know, it was on our roadmap and in our deck and everything to let people inscribe a message mm-hmm. to the recipient. You know, yep. so I was already thinking about doing that, uh, you know, charging nine ninety nine or fourteen ninety nine or something like that <laughs> to inscribe <laughs> a message along with with the the, uh, the escrowed Bitcoin gift. So, you know, not new. Uh, it's been made easier to do, obviously, with uh, with Taproot, or it was just kind of like more top of mind and kind of ex- expanded people's thinking around around what can what can be done uh, inscribing data onto Bitcoin. But yeah, I think this will just kind of like blow over, and there's not there's not much more interesting here with like NFTs on Bitcoin than there was with NFTs on on altcoins, which has obviously gone through its uh, its bubble busting phase already do you think that's true also for for brc20 and all these sort of you know primitive tokens that have emerged honestly not following it i mean like pepe is a scam and basically all these insiders you know launched this thing and nobody that didn't know what was going on realized that they were clocking all the profits from staking so you know just kind of a big nothing burger that doesn't matter in the long run yeah, I listen. I, I think the I think the take of it being a nothing burger is completely reasonable. I think we're you know uh, w- one of the things that is uh, always true in bear markets is that it, we're easily distracted by <laughs> whatever is the good thing to talk about. Um, but I actually want I want to talk about a different bear market for a minute. Obviously, the show is called Bitcoin Builders, and and you know a lot of what I'm interested in is the emergence and explosion of people building on Bitcoin now, but you made the decision to build on Bitcoin a lot earlier than a lot of people did. You know, what was, I'm interested in your sort of decision process of of kind of, you know, you're an entrepreneur, there's a million different types of things you could start. You could also go apply that energy to, you know, investing or any any other sort of number of things. What was the process to get sort of, you know, to Swan? What were the stages along the journey? Yeah, sure. So, and I guess maybe for those who don't know, I, I assume probably too much <laughs> that everyone knows Swan, but maybe just give a little introduction as well. Sure. So, uh, Swan Bitcoin, Swan.com is a, a financial services firm centered around Bitcoin. So, we're a Bitcoin brokerage. We have a high net worth division that serves HWs and companies globally. Uh, we have retirement products. So you can put Bitcoin in an IRA. Uh, we have a business focused division that helps with corporate treasuries and we have the Bitcoin benefit plan. So you can give some Bitcoin to your employees every month, that kind of thing. Uh, we have a pretty big media operation. So the Swan YouTube channel gets more views than any other Bitcoin channel sort of by a long shot, um, as far as Bitcoin only channels, um, what else? We we run Cafe Bitcoin on social audio. So five five mornings a week from seven to nine Pacific, ten to noon Eastern. Uh, that's pretty big Twitter spaces every day. Uh, we own the Pacific Bitcoin Conference, which is uh, October fifth and sixth. Is the second one. Sorry, it's a festival this year. Pacific <laughs> Bitcoin Festival, October fifth and sixth in Santa Monica. Uh, PacificBitcoin.com, and you know we're. We're partners in the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, so we have uh, some investments that we're we're making alongside that squad with uh, Dave Foley, James Lavish, Larry Lapard, Greg Foss, um, and we're just getting into more and more interesting ways to to help people on their Bitcoin journey. We uh, we bought Spectre last year, so we're launching Swan Custody uh, this fall. Should be out before the conference, so that'll be you know kind of like a a casa like experience really really simple we think it'll be by far the best user experience that anyone's ever seen for uh using multi-sig and setting up a multi-sig um so yeah just kind of in there in the mix doing doing things for bitcoiners and i think that's kind of the the end state for any company that wants to do something around bitcoin only is going to have to check a number of boxes for people because people don't want to have you know, 30 relationships with companies, they want to have a small number of relationships and they want those companies to do a lot of things for them. Uh, so I just think it's, it's basically impossible to just have a little Bitcoin app. You have to do more things for people than, than just one thing. 
Yeah. So, okay, great. That's a su super helpful intro. So, you know, obviously it didn't start with all those things. It started at a specific spar part, you know, where did it start A and B? Uh, I guess the original question is sort of what, what got you, what were the steps to kind of get you there? Cause I, you know, I do remember getting a telegram from you about give Bitcoin and, you know, I'm interested in where, where that fit along the journey. Yeah. So I, I guess just by, by way of introduction for anyone that's never seen me before, um, uh, used to work for big companies, worked for Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, McKinsey, Google, started investing in startups in like 2012 when I was still at Google, uh, got married and moved out to LA really to be closer to the Silicon Valley ecosystem and the burgeoning tech scene in LA with the whole Silicon Beach thing kind of taken off down here. And it was great. I started flying up first on surf air and then that got too expensive. So I started <laughs> taking the, the Southwest bus, but I would come up for day trips, you know, two, three times a week literally just go up in the morning, come back at night. And I was advising startups and cutting angel checks and just kind of doing an apprenticeship in, in the startup VC world. And that was kind of my 2013 to 2018. And then the last bull run caught my attention. And so that was, you know, probably April, May of 2017. And, you know, crypto was going nuts. And what I considered signal in the startup world, like Andreessen Horowitz, Union Square Ventures, you know, they were writing about all these tokens and how every marketplace would have its own money and all these different things. And I was totally bought in and super interested. And, you know, I, I wrote this like 50 page Google Doc of my thesis on a, you know, crypto token fund I was going to start and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, so it took me like 11 months 10 or 11 months. So like May till about March or April of 2018 to sort through all of that. And I, you know, met basically, you know, a wide swath of the people sort of at the top of the crypto industry and was diving in with two feet. And, uh, and along the way, I came to, you know, I would say, understand the truth, you could say, you know, anyone else could say at least believe that Bitcoin was the only thing that actually mattered in the space and that Bitcoin was dramatically different than all of the non Bitcoin altcoin crypto space. Um, and at a minimum from a sort of rational economic calculation, uh, I believe and believed since early 2018 that the problem that Bitcoin solves is two to three orders of magnitude larger than the sum total of the problems that, uh, altcoins are attempting to solve. And so the, the opportunity to me of working on Bitcoin looked a hundred to a thousand times bigger than all of altcoins combined. And so that was my cold, hard, you know, career choice rationale. But I also just couldn't imagine working on all of the crypto stuff. Once I understood how the sausage was made and I saw, you know, what the, what the process was for manufacturing an altcoin that would pump and how having anything of value wasn't really part of the equation that would actually have product market fit and do something other than add another building block to the snake eating its own tail and the sort of self-referential sort of trading tools and leverage for trading and leveraging up to trade crypto. Like that's the only innovation that's existed so far in crypto is, is trading more crypto. <laughs> um, so by mid 2018, I was trying to figure out how to do something like really of value in the Bitcoin space. Uh, I started a telegram group, which was kind of forming a fund and it was a Bitcoin ecosystem fund. And it was like me and Steve Lee and Dan Held and a few other people. And rolling into the fall, I was still consulting to normie startups. And I actually had one that I was working on myself that I had funding lined up for. And I was like sitting there on the fence do I go whole hog into Bitcoin or do I just start a normal startup <laughs> and do that? And I still love this idea, by the way, and I'm, I'm going to do it someday, but, uh, but we'll do it uh, someday after Swan. Um, and so, and then the, the bear market was just brutal. You know, I think it fell off a cliff in November of 2018. And, you know, that was when it finally broke through six down to, you know, 35 and ended up bottoming out at like 3150 in December. And, and I was still just like, wow, this thing is so far down. And I still can't think about anything else. And I still can't read about anything else. So like, clearly, as Rick Rubin would say, you know, you need to follow the thing that you're interested in. And the opportunities will come from your pursuit of the thing that you're interested in. 
Uh, and so I kept on kind of noodling on, on what my problems were in Bitcoin. And I figured if I could just like pass through that aperture, like a lot would open up. And I wanted to, I, I realized the problem that I thought I could help solve was reducing the amount of time that it took for someone to get up to speed on Bitcoin. So it really was the education. And I thought through code and media, Naval style, that could be done a lot better uh, and a lot faster than than it had been historically. And so the idea was, you know, let's start an education focused on ramp. Had the idea, I think, in uh, March or April of, of 2019. Uh, and I didn't think that there was room in the market and everybody kind of talked me out of there being room in the market for a direct on-ramp the way that Swan is today and uh, as we were at launch. And so I thought, well, let me sneak in with this gifting product and we'll see what happens. But I had very limited ambitions for that. I thought maybe we could drive it up into the you know tens of millions of valuation and flip it to somebody or something like that. And what happened after launching it in November, I think it was early November of 2019, we launched the gifting product and it was, it had so many hoops you had to jump through. You had to, you know, you, so it was ACH funding, but your balance didn't hit, you know, right away. We didn't, we didn't have a float. And so you basically couldn't even give the gift. You had to schedule the gift at least 10 days out. Right. You couldn't give somebody Bitcoin like right now or you could and they could get the message, but you wouldn't actually pull your your funds wouldn't arrive and we couldn't purchase the Bitcoin until 10 days later. Right. So there were all these all these hoops. I think that it was two percent and you could give a recurring gift as well. So you could set it up so you could give somebody a gift, you know, every week or every month as well. And it was nuts because in the first three, four weeks right away. 90% of the volume was people buying gifts for themselves and buying recurring gifts for themselves. And so all summer long, interestingly, in summer of 2019, uh, Pierre Richard, Friar Haas, and uh, and Gigi had been tweeting about like the best way to buy Bitcoin is just a dollar cost average. They they use dollar cost average. It really not quite the exact right use of that term, but let's call it automatic recurring purchases or auto DCA. And that over the long haul, not necessarily as a trading strategy, because if you can time bottoms, like obviously you can crush it by putting in giant sums of money at the bottom if if you're good at that. But really removing human psychology from it is actually more important for 99 plus percent of people. And because we chase shiny objects and we get scared when things fall. Uh, And so... That's what people were doing. And the fees were lower than the Coinbase app and the Gemini app or whatever. And it was Bitcoin only. So the whole Bitcoin community was kind of like lifting this thing up. And people were talking about this tiny, it was me in a dev shop at first. And then I was like, oh shit, we need customer support. And so I called, I think, uh, Brady and Brandon, so Brady, Brady Swenson and Brandon Quidham, uh, who were just kind of well-known content guys that had marketing skills and so they joined up, uh, Brecky, and then Jan obviously was uh, was crucial because he's you know, so Jan Pritzker, the uh, author of Inventing Bitcoin, my still favorite introductory book uh, to to Bitcoin, um, came on as co-founder and CTO. I think around December of twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen, and yeah, it was basically over the holidays that we were like, okay, we've got something here. People are actually using us as an on ramp for themselves. We've got the back end built, can't be called give Bitcoin. We were, uh, we were calling it internally save Bitcoin, which is a horrible brand uh, for about a month before we came up with the name Swan at the beginning of January. And that's the reason we announced Swan in January, because we already had the back end built. We, all, we knew all we had to do basically was, was skin it and market it and we could launch. And we got Swan out uh, as planned before the end of March. I think it was March 30th of 2020 that we launched Swan. It's quite quite a time to launch, right? Going into, I mean, obviously we're, we're in COVID. Uh, you're a couple months out from Paul Tudor Jones talking about Bitcoin and sort of that, that narrative starting. I mean, what was the, what was the first six months like? How, you know, what the product, what was the state of the product, I guess, at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really sign up for a recurring purchase plan was the, was the whole thing until, toward the end of that year um, of 2020. And so it was, I think we had a maximum 10K a week plan 
that was available, but you know, people were finding it and promoting it. And that's how we met Lynn Alden, who was not known in the Bitcoin space at all because she signed up as one of our large customers uh, in right there after launch. And that's how we got to know her. Um, and, you know, it was just growing and growing and growing. And it's, you know, sort of all has the flavor of recurring revenue, which you like, obviously. And then in the fall, I think it was about November of 2020, people started emailing us and getting in touch and saying, Hey, can I just like, why are you a million dollars? And Jan and I were like, let's figure out how to let them wire us a million dollars yeah. <laughs> and take that. And that was kind of the genesis of, of Swan private client services, which we sort of soft launched uh, at the beginning of 2021 and kind of officially launched around May. And that very quickly within a few months became half of the company's revenue. So we basically added, added, the ability to serve high net worth individuals around the world, uh, the first half of 2021. And then we also, we turned on uh, spot buys and we actually got enough money. We borrowed money to be able to have a float so that people could buy Bitcoin like right away and not just have to do the recurring purchases that turned on. I remember uh, it was the new all time high. It was the day we broke through 20 K it was uh, December 16th of 2020. It was the day that we turned on spot purchases. Um, so yeah, so that's that's obviously taken off and you know, people like to hit the buy button, you know. We we try to we actually have still probably somewhere between 70 and 75% of our customers actually have recurring purchase plans. Uh but the vast majority of the volume, you know, definitely over two thirds is actually spot buys and like large one time smash buys. Holding aside the sort of um uh, mission orientation underneath it. How has like has has the Bitcoin only focus enabled? Has it you know been useful from a, just a product standpoint in terms of clarity and specificity of of what you needed to do next at any given time? Yeah, yeah, I know you have a good background in tax, so you'll you'll understand how Jan and Jeremy, our head of product, talk about it. They talk about a tax surface and and just you know how much less you have to worry about when you're dealing with one asset. And again, I I, I also think the other side of you know, with constraint comes creativity with discipline actually comes creativity. You know, you think of the, uh, the old Twitter character limit and how creative people get given the constraint, you know, um, I think of it like that too. Like what are all the things that people need solved in Bitcoin and what are the different ways that they need to buy? And so we can do things that a crypto exchange just can't like, think of the idea of actually just having a a private client services team right? A bunch of, you know, ex Bridgewater, Morgan Stanley, Goldman guys who love Bitcoin and speak that language and can handle these high net worth people around the world. Uh, you can't do that at Coinbase or Gemini or Kraken. So one, everybody would have to be registered because your council, even though they, you know, pay lip service to these things being not securities at the end of the day, they know they're super exposed. And that's why Andreessen Horowitz got like 85 people registered when they went whole hog into crypto in 2018. They got all those people registered as reps because they knew that they were shilling securities, right? Um, And there's no one that can with high integrity sit there and talk about you know, the merits of these assets, like they're for trading. And so the only thing that really makes sense, if you're actually being honest and high integrity with like a high net worth person and you want to earn their trust and you don't want to lose their trust by lying to them is maybe something like the Pfeffer portfolio, you know, the famous like, okay, I'm 80, 85% Bitcoin own the asset. That is basically the index, but there's some alpha if you give some money as an LP to one of these insiders that's, you know, creating their own pump and dump token. So give some money to Paradigm or, you know, Polychain or something like that, right? He wrote that um, thesis in 2017. It's wild know, how it's, prescient it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because like there's money to be made when things move and when they pump and they dump, if you sell before the dump, then, you know, you can be like Galaxy and not lose money on Luna. <laughs> You know, I think no matter how much money Jump gave to the Luna ecosystem, like they made way, way, way more money. They were rumored yep. to make like eight or nine billion dollars on that shit in 2021, you know, on the way up. So uh, they can take a beating the next year and still be in the black by a long shot. Um, so, 
Yeah, so I just think I, I think it's long term greedy to be Bitcoin only. Uh, I think for me, I'm just I I feel like we've built a great team and a great tech stack and a really good media brand. And so when I look at Bitcoin, it's the same thing that I used to look at in startups. Like you don't want to be Zynga and have Facebook pull the rug, right? And you don't want to be building on all this crypto stuff and have the SEC pull the rug or just have the centralized team that builds this alterable at any time at the whim of the founder layer one and whatever you're building on top of it just gets rugged. Like that's the whole point. Like I wanted to get away from that. And so I know that building on and for Bitcoin the inputs of like effort and experience and knowledge and networking, putting that in, we're going to have, we're going to build equity value every day and no one can rug pull us. So I want to come to the team because I think this has been a very unique part of what you guys have built over there. Uh, a couple things that I think are are notable. One is obviously you have sort of modeled in a way that I think a lot of companies would be and probably are very envious of using content marketing really well, sort of understanding uh, that it's not a conversion medium. It's a sort of a, a brand building medium, but that also sort of, you know, ends up having that type of effect. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's, it makes sense that a Bitcoin company would get that because it's sort of a long play. So I'm interested to know kind of how intentional that was versus organic and emergent. Uh, but then secondly, I think one of the things that people are constantly uh, surprised and excited by is most companies tend to have, to the extent that they have a personality, it's a personality at the top, right? And the leader's brand shapes the brand of everything. And I think certainly there's a, a part of that with Swan, like people know you, but the individuals who make up the Swan team really all have their own thing. They all have, you know, they're known for different things within the community. Like, you know, they've got their mushroom thing over there here. They've got their sun thing over here. And within that, they also like have, this very interesting, diverse set of opinions about a lot of stuff. And it's a, it's an unusual thing, I think, to have a team that feels coherent and sort of all brand aligned while also being such big individuals. And, and I'm wondering, again, kind of, again, how intentional that was versus it just happened to be sort of like attracting like. So the first question was around, was it intentional to do uh, sort of media driven mm -hmm. customer acquisition? Yep. And yeah, that was always the plan from the start. And it's something that I've done before and kind of understand, um, you know, I, I have a broadcast degree way back in the day and was a really shitty NBC TV reporter <laughs> long, long, long ago. Um, and I've been involved with a lot of startups that have used media to, as their marketing, basically to generate inbound. So you just put out content that is valuable and that generates inbound. Um, you know, I, I had a front row seat for the last couple of decades to uh, the growth of 37 Signals in Basecamp. So they wrote, you know, remote and rework and all of that. So one of my best friends who actually officiated my wedding and is uh, one of the writers of, of my book with Brady and Stefan Lavera that's coming out this year, uh, Bright Orange Future, is a guy named Matt Ruby. Um, and, you know, he was employee number one of 37 Signals before they even put out Basecamp and was ghostwriter on a couple of their books. And, you know, so I've always kind of watched that. I was also a huge fan of, uh, of college humor um, back, in the, back in the early aughts and mid aughts. And before they sold to IAC, uh, they had no ads. They had hilarious content and videos, and then they owned Busted Tees. And the only ads on their site were these t-shirts, like, you know, getting lucky in Kentucky and all that kind of stuff. And they sold the heck out of these t-shirts. Um, and that was their monetization. And, you know, then I would look at like other brands that, that grew up and started content efforts. Like, you know, Casper started like a sleep website and I was looking at it and I was like, Bitcoin is even closer. It's even better. Like you can do funny stuff and then sell t-shirts and and that's pretty good. And then like even tighter is the integration between selling mattresses and having a sleep website. Like that's, that's really close, but it's not a website about mattresses. Right. But with Bitcoin, 
the media is about the actual thing that you're selling, there's actually never been a tighter integration uh, between like the content that you would make and what you're actually selling. And so to me, it's just kind of the perfect thing. And the other thing is like before we took a lot of, you know, investor funds and spent years on this, like there's a lot of other things that I and, you know, a lot of the senior team already have previous successes. You know, before we spent years on this, we wanted to prove to ourselves that we could acquire customers and fans of Swan cost effectively. Um, because if you are like, you can't compete in the auctions on Facebook and Google versus the altcoin casinos, because obviously they're getting people in there and ripping their faces off with these altcoin, you know, trying to get you to like, you know, trade Polygon and trade this and trade that and trade this. And all the notifications are, you know, and all the, the layout of the site has all these dark patterns trying to like grab you with the shiny object and sending marketing emails about how some altcoins going to moon or whatever it is. Right. It's just all this, this horrible online casino, dark pattern stuff. And all the people that come from it come from online gaming and they understand, you know, how to do notifications to get the whales to spend the most on the digital items, or they come from ad tech and they used to run, you know, you know, brain powder scams. And now they're doing crypto. Like, like that, that whole, it's all online gaming, online gambling, and online advertising is basically all of the talent for the crypto exchanges. And they can spend enormous sums of money because they know they can monetize these people and they can, uh, they can harvest them uh, once they give them a, get them in the door. And so you have to create your own media because you can't spend ad dollars against that because they can monetize these people so much better than you can if you're actually doing something good for them. And so you just have to tell people like we're, we're here and we're a trusted partner and we're going to, you know, you're going to join this, this community and get all this like great knowledge and education. And you're going to have somebody to talk to and uh, you know, get on team Bitcoin and that's your tribe. And you know, you basically like building a movement. I don't know if this is something you guys have talked publicly about, uh, but do you, what is what is your investor base like? Did you guys self fund at the beginning? Did you have angels? Is it? I mean, have you taken actual factual venture capital at this point? Yeah, I mean, we we don't really announce our rounds like aggressively, and it's not really like that important because we've we've been fortunate enough to not have to raise that much money because our burn has always been pretty low. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a pretty good revenue profile. So we kind of try to stay just like a little bit out over our skis, yep, but not go nuts. Um, and so yeah, I guess like all all told, all cash in historically is probably about thirty million, but it's been it's been over lots of tranches. So we've probably had like seven or eight different different small rounds along the way. The the reason that I, it's sort of not just a, a a generic question. Part of what was what was triggering as you were talking is. I think that beyond just Bitcoin, there's also a larger shift happening right now in kind of startups in general. Uh, or uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, AI might change this, but you know, in the absence of um, the super easy money that existed in zero interest rate world for the last ten years, all of a sudden people started to think like, okay you know, if it's not growth at all costs, how do I build a real business? Now, like I said, I think you can maybe hold aside the insane hype around anything that has an AI, you know, thing in its title right now. I think startups in other categories are actually having to think for the first time in 10 or 15 years about building businesses, not just building growth engines. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it's interesting sort of, again, how you've how you guys have ended up, you know, modeling a lot of that. I, get, I think just by virtue of having a long-term perspective and probably looking for alignment across everything, you know, including the investors that you bring in. Yeah. And I, it was really obvious to us, I think even by 2020, definitely by 2021, that this is not a good acquisition target. And so growing unprofitably and hoping that you're going to get taken out is just a loser's game for a Bitcoin only company like Swan anyway, um, because our whole thing is about being high integrity. And like, I, I think of like, I can't think of an acquirer. I can't think of anyone that we would fit with. Like there's, there's no one that makes sense. So you have to build this thing for, you know, profitability, certainly in the long term and ideally in the midterm. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah.
No, it's it's just it's just an interesting interesting dynamic. So, you know, it's been now. Uh, I guess we could be years. a money losing public company. There's a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> there is there are a lot of those. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's your exit really, opportunity. Don't yeah. don't really want to plan for that. Yeah, I feel like aiming for that might not be the the thing. Yeah. So three and a half years. You know, what have you learned that was surprising about? Uh, Bitcoin, you know, about, the, about your customer base, about buying behavior, you know, uh, th- things that you might not have expected. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I guess, I mean, one insight, and this is kind of fresh for me. I'm just kind of like really putting my finger on it. And I think we've kind of done it without being able to define why. And now it's becoming clear what's going on. And it's basically, you, you talked about it a little bit in referencing the, the, the second part of your question that I didn't answer about the uh, individuals at Swan, you know, kind of wearing their heart on their sleeve and just like showing who they are. Uh, I think it all just comes down to being genuine and kind of being, I, I, call, I, I call it like a full stack human, but it's basically just if you can be the same person at work and with your family and with your friends and in business or whatever at all times and don't feel like you have to hide any of that. Uh, You don't have to keep track of the faces that you're showing to different people. And then it's really easy to be genuine. And then that's really attractive and makes people want to be around you and do business with you and just kind of like hang out. Right. So I think that's, that's something we try to really encourage and instill in our people to like be exactly who you want to be and be exactly how you feel. And, uh, it'll work out because people will like you and they will like the company that you, that you are associated with. Um, I'll give an example, like, you know, it seems like we're like a basketball company that sells Bitcoin sometimes. Cause we just, like there's a number of people at Swan initially that like basketball a lot. And I talk about it and tweet about it and play and, you know, had, had a, had a men's league game last night at El Segundo high, which was awesome. By the way, I'd never been down there before. It turns <laughs> out it was actually the, uh, it's the school. It was the external school for a uh, 90210. Oh, really? Amazing. So you're rolling up and you're like, this looks vaguely familiar. Yeah. And, and Ulrich, <laughs> so funny. Uh, Kobe Duran on Twitter was like, yeah, this is 90210, bro. Uh, the fake Beverly Hills high. Um, so, and then that just kind of spiraled and turned to, into a thing. So then basketball players who liked Bitcoin started applying. And now, you know, the, the team is just loaded up with people who played Bitcoin. Like Armani is on our marketing team. He played for Yale and pro ball in Europe and is on the Panamanian national team still. Uh, one of our finance, junior finance guy just finished playing for the Montenegro national team for a bunch of years. Uh, Ryan Flynn, who runs Swan Advisor Services, was a D1 baller. Uh, even people that I don't even realize were into Bitcoin or were into basketball, I'll find out like a year later that, you know, like one of our customer service guys, turns out he like is number two all time in assists and number one in points at his high school in Wisconsin. And like, I had no idea when we hired him. Uh, even, you know, I've tried to hire like a nerdy finance guy, Dave Song, dude bro on Twitter. And then it turns out, you know, like his his Korean men's team took third place in the country and he's a lights out shooter. And he was by far our number one star at the three on three tournament at Pacific Bitcoin last year. The guy's just like knockdown shooter, um, you know, and that that leads that genuineness kind of leads to its own thing. Again, it's like it's a constraint. We're doing just basketball, but I don't really have anything to tweet about golf. You know, like I'd rather tweet something about Seattle's minor league basketball team or something about the Sonics from the early nineties than I would, you know, some sport that I'm not as interested in. And I think people see that and they see that it's genuine. And then, you know, if I was tweeting a bunch about F1 or golf, they would know that that's not real. And then why should they trust me about Swan and Bitcoin? What do you make of the sort of emergence of uh, uh, more and more Bitcoin startups, more and more lightning startups? I mean, obviously I, I'm sure you're noticing it as well. You know, do, oh, yeah. is this, I'm to funding you, a lot does, of them. Does it, yeah, right. Does it does it feel inevitable? Is it like you know? Are you surprised by sort of the the uptick right now? You know, what, what what do you make of it? I mean, I think it's what you would expect, right? Like the, I think of now it finally does feel like we're kind of in the in the '90s 
as far as uh, looking at the internet and its development, it does feel like we might have entered the 90s. A lot of people, you know, three, four years ago were saying like, oh, it feels like 1997. And I was like, bro, it feels like 1982. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're so far behind. But it does, it does feel like there's kind of an explosion of attempts at innovation. I still think that uh, venture scale monetization for Bitcoin medium of exchange feels a few years off. And that's why we don't go whole hog into it. We will launch lightning withdrawals later this year. And, you know, we'll have a lightning wallet in the Swan app probably next year. Um, but I don't think there's like a big market to grab because nobody wants to spend Bitcoin. Yep. And, you know, right now the best tool for the job for medium of exchange for better or worse in a lot of places is like tether on Tron because it's working and you don't yep. need it. You don't need to know that it's going to work in five years. You just need to work right this second and it's cheap and it's fast and it's like whatever. Um, so I think, I think the remittances angle is cool and the volumes are up and the, the lightning bulb went on for me when you started to see companies on the receiving end that were going to do the acquiring on the receiving side, uh, knowing that they're there and that anyone, whether it's strike or Swan or whoever could be cracking now that have lightning withdrawals like you can just buy the bitcoin and as long as they have an automatic conversion you could also just set up an interface where you're sending dollars or sending you know pesos or something and then it's actually the company on the receiving end that has the local banking relationship that makes sure the conversion rate is good and that it shows up as fiat currency in their local bank account if that's what they want instead of instead of receiving sats so it was like you know pouch in the philippines and, you know, two, two Vietnamese startups and knowing that they're handling customer acquisition on the receiving end, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so that actually got me a lot more bullish on the, on the remittance use case than a U.S. company uh, yep. trying to, you know, build operations in market. And that's what's really cool about an open protocol where you're sending this money over the Bitcoin network or over the Lightning network and, it doesn't even matter who's on either end. It's intermediated by the Bitcoin network. So I'm actually pretty bullish on remittances, um, but it's going to get pretty competitive pretty quickly. And, you know, if there's an edge, it's going to be super competitive. And, uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not sure, again, like there may be a couple of companies that do really well and, and kind of, hit escape velocity in remittances. But again, they, they'll never have like a real moat because it takes almost nothing to enter that business. Like if Swan wanted to do, you know, Swan remit or Swan pay in two years, we could be up and running in, you know, a couple of months and we'd have a huge brand and we'd be able to go after that too. Yep. And get our fair share, right? Yeah, no, I think it's interesting. I think having a as weird as it sounds, I think that the world's going to look a lot better for business when people don't assume that venture economics are right for every business they want to start. You know what I mean? Like, which has sort of historically been the case, you know, like, you know, for the last whatever decade, it was you were either building a, a venture business or a lifestyle business. So there's no in between, you know, and I think that that, that might be shifting a little bit. One thing I do see, which rhymes with something I have seen over and over again in, in Silicon Valley startups is uh, when someone can't figure out how to acquire customers, they provide what they do as a service to other companies and essentially hope to switch to enterprise instead and like providing that thing as a service. And I think there is a little bit of that going on in the Bitcoin space where a lot of companies that started out hoping to be able to monetize by acquiring customers uh, end up then wanting to provide services to the next batch of venture funded companies. And then their revenue is essentially being provided by the tier yeah. down of, of venture funding, which is super common in new industries. And, and it doesn't mean that there won't be winners, um, but it's a dynamic that appears to be at play in a lot of the lightning ecosystem. And it's something that I've seen time and time again in in new ecosystems 
outside of Bitcoin as well. So it's it's a it's a familiar pattern. Yeah, no, I, I think it's I it's, there's, it's a good reminder that there's you know e- even with the sort of excitement around all these new startups, there's going to be growing pains and things that don't work and you know startups that fail as part of it. I really think the whole thing, the whole enchilada for surviving and building like a large valuable business in Bitcoin is is having a customer acquisition engine. And that's why, you know, as much as, you know, you have your quibbles about strikes valuation or whatever, but like Jack is awesome on TV. Yep. And he gets on TV a lot. And so that's like cheap user acquisition. It's free, you know, so it's, it's an amazing engine. And, you know, I think that's, that's a pretty good bet to make. And I think, you know, Swan is like that, right? You've got uh, an amazing user acquisition engine. And, and as much as, you know, Unchained has, uh, you know, Parker's great writing and a book coming out and, you know, can leverage like Tour de Mista reports and things like that. Like you've got to have something that pulls people in or I just think you're probably DOA. Yep. Yep. No, I, I think it's I think it's very salient advice, uh, especially for people who are starting to think about these companies now, because there often isn't that mindset among especially technical folks who you know, see a problem that they want to fix and, and sort of go in it. Yeah. What do you think, what is your guess or your team's guess on which communities spill over into Bitcoin or find it, you know, call it in whatever the next cycle coming up is? Do you think, or maybe a bit, you know, do you think there are specific categories that you, that you think are sort of on the verge that you can imagine coming in? So, I mean, the, the obvious one that's always been the most adjacent is the investing community, mm-hmm. right? And that's why people talk about investing and macro and where Bitcoin fits in portfolios and how do you save your wealth and stuff. So it's it's like the investing community. The, the second best community to draw new Bitcoiners from is non-Bitcoin altcoins. So it's people that, you know, either learn that they're garbage or get burned by their favorite coin going down 98% or getting rugged or whatever it is. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I should learn about this Bitcoin thing, right? Um, and then after that, I don't think, I don't know if it's actually the right way to think about it, that like a community could flip because people who are into self-improvement or being jacked or being into keto or whatever would just be like naturally into Bitcoin. Um, I think it's more... I think it's more you you market to those people deliberately because you have a strong affinity for that community. Mm-hmm. And like if Swan just got, you know, 50% of the people who are into basketball and also into Bitcoin bought from Swan were a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. Right? So... I don't know that you necessarily think about flipping the whole community as you do about just, you know, penetrating certain communities to the degree that uh, those people would would be interested in you. Um, I do think that there's there's always moments in time where Bitcoin can come to the fore and and be more interesting because of something that's going on over a small period of time, like I, I'm a lot of people are trying to figure out, like, is there some leverage for Bitcoin here with, you know, DeSantis being somewhat pro Bitcoin. And, you know, if uh, RFK Jr. is going to be in the race and actually gets up on, you know, on TV a bit and is talking pro Bitcoin and actually demonstrates some understanding of it and kind of helps it. You know, that's a moment in time because both are unlikely to win the primary. So you got to take advantage of the of the six months or nine months that they're on TV. Right. And and try to make something happen around that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's always a struggle to think like, oh, could you just like flip everyone who loves Harley, Harley Davidson, you know, into Bitcoiners? Right. And I, I just, I, I, we've been butting our head up against that and thinking about adjacent communities or who's, you know, most likely to be into Bitcoin. I mean, I, this is basically how I use AI. Uh, yeah. I just use chat GPT trying to, trying to find <laughs> like, you Love know, it. which, which country stars fans are most likely to buy Bitcoin or, Man, you know, I, which, I, which sports fans are most likely to buy Bitcoin, that kind of thing. Not, not for nothing. I think country fans are radically undertapped in that. Uh, that, that Jake Owens is a Bitcoiner. Uh, yep. I've noticed yeah, that. We, there's, I there's talked a couple to Jake of, personally. He's a great yeah. guy. 
There's a, there's a couple others. No, I think, I, but by the way, that's not just Bitcoin companies, like every brand that's not like a beer brand, basically it radically under markets to the country audience, which is crazy to me. Totally agree with you, man. Yeah. Um, how has this year been just from an operational standpoint for you guys? I mean, have you dealt with sort of, you know, I, th I think I read that you guys had dealt with banking issues, uh, but you know, what, what has that been like? Well, just our like, you know, vendor payroll account, we got debanked from Citibank last fall, uh, which was hilarious. So anyway, you can read about that in the New York Times or something if you want. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't really existential. Um, you know, we had money in other accounts. It was more I wanted to ring the alarm bell and let people know that this could happen with absolutely no notice, no email, no phone call. Uh, you know, just just shut down. And, you know, that could have been existential if we hadn't already uh, diversified our banking relationships. So I was just trying to let people know to make sure you have multiple banks and that you have enough to make, you know, a couple payrolls out of multiple accounts. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, you know, I guess all the crypto scams blowing up and ripping everyone's faces off and, uh, you know, basically created a lot of incentive for regulators and banks to take a closer look. And I think that backlash was, you know, not coordinated, but totally inevitable. Um, you know, I'm basically firmly on record saying that I think that choke point 2.0, quote unquote, is basically like blockchain crypto VC marketing to try to cover up for the bullshit they pulled off over the last few years. Um, and thinking that there's some kind of like bogeyman and again, usually trying to recruit the help of Bitcoiners to fight for shit coins. Um, so I just don't buy it at all. I think it's just like a very natural backlash and like, you have no problem getting an operating account to run a legitimate business, um, for Bitcoin companies from any of, you know, thousands of banks. That's not a problem. I think it's when you're doing all this shady crypto stuff that they're like, Hey, wait a minute, this, this looks a little off and it, it it certainly blew us up last year and some of our some of our fellow banks didn't fare very well dealing with this stuff so let's let's be a little tighter on our on our risk profiling for this crypto stuff so i think that's pretty natural um it's annoying to me because it's created a lot more regularly regulatory scrutiny for some of the back-end vendors that we use mm -hmm. and so like you know like prime trust and zero hash and bitgo uh, kind of the three big custodians that serve fintechs and crypto apps and Bitcoin apps um, for trade settlement, for custody, for KYC AML. Like some of the states looked at that and said, hey, you know what, we're going to we're going to make you reapply with some newer, higher standards for, you know, your MTLs in our state. And so we've had to basically diversify our back end and create a little bit more of a patchwork and also just kind of pull forward our plans to face customers ourselves and just have the MTLs and the compliance. And we hired a GC and a COO with this experience and kind of developing our own relationships for that type of banking and, and setting up a roadmap where, uh, you know, we'll have multiple custodians and settlement partners, even in the same state and, uh, and also building out uh, everything so that we can face customers ourselves uh, in the very near future. So definitely accelerated those plans and that causes you to bring on more staff sooner. It causes your burn rate to increase and, you know, sort of creates little fire drills as we lost a couple of states and had to bring them back on with different partners and make people go through KYC again and crap like that. But, you know, the good thing is we've got a good brand, we've got a lot of trust, and I think everyone understands why it's happening, which is because of all the fraud in the crypto space and that it's not the fault of Bitcoin, Bitcoiners and Bitcoin companies. And so they seem to just give us a mulligan as we sort it out. What are you most excited for coming up for the rest of this year, uh, either either with Swan specifically or with Bitcoin more broadly? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the most exciting thing going on right now for Bitcoin adoption is that banking crisis that happened in March and continues to kind of royal has created a very fertile, very fertile ground for receptivity to the Bitcoin message. And so I, I think that we have something more like, you know, 18 to 30 months 
to be able to grow the number of people that are into Bitcoin and that this should be like sort of a much longer, more drawn out bull run of Bitcoin adoption than we've ever had before, where, you know, Google search trends are already above the peaks of where they've been in, in previous bull markets on some weeks over the last couple of months uh, for Bitcoin. And so I think, you know, in, in 2013, 17 and 21, we had Bitcoin frenzies, you know, of four to six months, let's say. And now we're already in a bit of a frenzy when it comes to the willingness of someone to, to learn about Bitcoin. And it makes sense because, you know, the last time we had a banking crisis was 2013 and it was Cyprus. So there were, you know, 0.1% as many people that had heard of Bitcoin and it was a tiny country far away. And now there's a banking crisis in the United States and a thousand times more people know something about Bitcoin. So it's an amazing time to be spreading the message and talking about it. And it's also one of the reasons that I think it's just like, I mean, it's just kind of annoying. It's why I just kind of like shut down any conversation about this other crap that just doesn't matter. This is the best time in the history of Bitcoin by far. And it might be the best time for the rest of the decade to be spreading the Bitcoin message. And so, no, I just don't have any time for your frogs or whatever. <laughs> I love it. I think it's a great message to end on. I think people, not just in Bitcoin or not just in crypto or not just in uh, business at all, like we spend, we forget that we get to choose what to spend our time thinking on and, yeah. and spend our time engaging with. And The I, I mute button is amazing and they don't even know you have them muted. You I don't know. have to block people. You can I just agree. mute them. I am I am an inveterate <laughs> muter cause for the exactly that reason. Like it's like if yeah. it you know if it pops up, it's the whole thing. Um, Corey, listen, uh, it's awesome. I think uh, I think obviously Swan's success is testament to, uh, to to building it with integrity the way that you guys have. Uh, you know, very excited to to have you guys as part of the community and continuing to build this out. And appreciate you hanging out for for a little while uh, this afternoon. Yeah, for sure, man. And I just wanted to thank you by the way for starting this show and then also uh, your AI show which a bunch of my friends are listening to and I'm catching them when I can. But uh, I hope that's the pattern that people follow that you don't like, if you need to do more than just Bitcoin, there's a whole wide world of things to do other than shit coins. You know, I always talk yeah. about this, like they're like, if you weren't working in Bitcoin, you'd be working in crypto. It's like, no, I would start another startup or I'd be a VC or I'd do private equity or I'd open a restaurant or I'd go back and be a consultant or work for Google. Like, the list of things that I would do before being a full-time scammer <laughs> is basically infinite. Yeah. I mean, listen for, you know, I've, I've always said, you know, when I started the breakdown, it's like the thing that interests me is big picture power shifts and, and, you know, hold like hold aside affinity for any type of coin or not. Like it was just very obvious to me that Bitcoin was a player on the big picture power shift stage. And it, there is, it, it, man, even if you love super cheap, weird in-game transactions enabled by Solana, I don't think there's anything inconsistent with that and understanding that like this thing that was created in this totally different way with a person who vacated themselves, which is completely like any founder in history and has spent the last 12 years being up more than the Federal Reserve and is, you know, whatever. Like it's not hard, I don't think, to come to the conclusion that there's something uniquely powerful about that and important in the context of, you know, global lack of trust. So like that to me was so obvious and you know for the 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 there's only so much time you can spend on a on a daily show on on everything and if you know bit builders for me was like wanting to go explore this side you know with entrepreneurs that i like with creative people that i like in that domain ai just emerged i think for so many of us i mean for all of us basically as another big picture power shift and we're all just trying to figure out you know what what comes next with it so it's like well all right well that's it's pretty obvious to me you know and i i think my my journey with it was like, I, I think the big thing was like realizing that I didn't just want to kind of start a podcast network where I went out first and funded other people or, or you know, kind of brought other networks on. I happened to have two other shows that I wanted to start. So, you know, so here I am doing three shows like an idiot. But there you go. Well, <laughs> yeah. listen, man, I love this format. Happy to come on again in the future. Check in once a year or something. But uh, congratulations. Appreciate it. Awesome, Corey.